about the applications of ray tracing in astronomy, underwater acoustics, and game development. So we would first be looking at a, a brief introduction to ray tracing, and then we'd be looking at the physics aspect of ray tracing, ray tracing in astronomy, underwater acoustics, and then the graphics aspects of ray tracing, and now and then ray tracing in game development. So what exactly is ray tracing? So if, if you guys aren't sitting in complete darkness right now, I want you all to look at an object, like any object in your room, and trace a straight line to that object from your point of view. So, and that straight line, trace that straight line to a part towards the light source in your room. And that is basically what tra ray tracing is. You're just basically tracing the rays, whether it be light rays, uh, sound rays, x-rays, etc. So, um, so yeah, that basically is just the calculate part of the waves or particles. And this is done through a system with regions of varying propagation, velocity, absorption particles, and reflective surfaces. So there are multiple ways to do these calculations. And the easiest way you could do this is to imagine like if you're going backwards. Um, and that is basically what I explained in the beginning. So when you start from the eye and you go through to the pixel to the screen, and then you fo just follow that path, and you follow if it bounces off mirrors until you find an object with the color that it had last hit on its way to your eye. And under these circumstances, the wave fronts, it may bend and it may change direction, it may reflect off surfaces, and this can complicate the analysis. And this is why ray tracing is here to help solve this. So, looking at the physics aspect of ray tracing, so first, we can look at um, the ray diagram. So I'm sure some of you guys re might remember this from physics. Um, oh, hold on. So basically, yeah, so this line here um, is your focal point. And the distance between that focal point, let me put the laser. The distance between that focal point and the mirror is called the focal life. And oops. How do you um um I kind of get back to play the slides, the video. Uh, I guess I might try switching to um, <laughs> from the, the annotation hmm. mode. If you could get out of that, I might fix it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I tried, and none of these is letting me. Um, um, Let me. Okay, maybe to, I guess, cut on South Park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, so, so, yeah, so this is the focal life here. And then when you have an object on the outside of the focal point, the distance between the distance, so sorry. Oh, this is that. So yeah, so, so yeah, the distance between the object and the mirror is called DO, and then it shows the height of that object. So here you can see that the object, um, the light ray, it traces from here to the mirror, and then it reflects over here to that arrow right there. And then let's say you have another ray from the object that passes through the focal point to the mirror, then this would basically just bounce back. And when these two intersect over here, this is the location of the image, and this is the real image over here. 
and something that you guys, if you're interested, you can play around. Like this is something you can um, just put like the lights, uh, the rays, and you could put like a glass, a circle glass con convex concave mirrors, and you can see exactly how it can reflect and how it refracts. So now we go into the first example. So relativistic, relativistic ray tracing in astronomy. So we will be looking at the neutron star for this one. So some things that you would take into account with the relativistic ray tracing. First of all, is that the light rays they can they can get bent. So the neutron stars, they are close to being black, black holes. So you can see the light on the surface of the far side of the object. So you can see, basically you can see more than 50% of their surface due to that, that bending light. So if you were close enough to a neutron star, that neutron star would appear, <coughs> excuse me, wider than its diameter due to that bending light. Another thing to take into account with this is the frame dragon effect. So due to the speed of the pulsar, as you can see um, here, it like, gets faster. It drags the space time around and the light rays would get pulled into the orbits and that will get twisted before reaching the surface. And another effect to take into account is the Doppler shifting of the light or the X-rays as the surface moves around the stars. So the hotspots would come towards the observer and this would change the frequency distribution. So some researchers I had credited at the end of um, this presentation um, if you want to model, so if you want to use relativistic ray tracing to model and to build a neutron star, image of a neutron star, you would first have to start with a simple model of the neutron star here to recreate the X-ray spect spectrum. And what they had done this was with NASA's NICER, which I'll show just now. So the researchers had started with a model that had two hotspots, if you can see um, the image on your right over here. So these two hotspots that correspond to the two magnetic poles. And then what they did is simulated that system and they explored the profile that was um, produced. So this is on the left, left image over here. And then after that, after they simulated everything, they moved the hotspots around and like they change the parameters such as the radius, the surface temperature and so on until it begins to converge to something that had matched what they had seen. So as you can see on the image on the right over here. And this for them, this took about 500,000 hours on a supercomputer to render. So I'll go to So this is the NASA NICER, and this is how they had um, put the first ever surface map of the neutron star. So basically, you can just see um, this is what they had modeled and using the NICER. So now moving on. We will now look at relativistic ray tracing in astronomy. So for this, we would um, we, so first we would look at general relativity. So this is what we assume that the black hole space time, and we we put we then would put fluid mechanics into this, and then we would allow the magnetic field to evolve with that fluid. 
and then this would give um so so um right so after this after so once you have that fluid description so when you apply the fluid mechanics to general relativity and you have the fluid description of the plasma of the black hole you can now put this into plasma physics and thermodynamics and this will tell us how the electrons would behave in the flow so once all of this all these three are ready we can now you apply ray tracing to that to turn that physics into an image which is the black hole image so on the left of um, the left in left image right here this is a model of the Sagittarius A star. So the supermassive black hole is at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So the points you can see here are the circles and the errors that are observed the data points of radio and infrared flux. And on your, so this was actually taken in um, around 1998. So on the right, this show the right image here, it shows the higher end of the X-ray. So this graph you see on the right is called an X-ray timing. And NASA with the spacecraft that monitors the X-ray binaries, when they process those, they can determine very, very distinct features, which are called QPO. This is quality periodic oscillations. And this frequency is in kilohertz. And for this type of picture, though, this is just one single point at this moment. So to get multiple images, of course, we'd use the many radio telescopes we have around the world. We would get the various images, and each telescope would give us a baseline. So the longer the baseline, the more finer the features we can get of the black hole. And now, so... So basically for a single pixel model and the X-ray, you would need to calculate this numerically and the general relativistic ray tracing would be used to demonstrate this. And with the general relativistic ray tracing, so if the space time is flat, so basically if you just like go in the horizontal, the rays are just going horizontal and it's moving in a straight line but if you introduce a heavy object and drop that into, into the straight line, so it goes at the bottom and brings down everything, then that is going to bend the particles. And that is why the photons would appear to be curved, like how I was explaining before, they appear to, to be bent. And this is called geodesics. And yeah, so basically using that, um, I don't I don't have the algorithm here right now to show like exactly how they had used ray tracing, but I can um I can add a team. I can always link you guys after. But yeah, so they use that and they produce these black hole images that you see here, and this as well. So now we will look at ray tracing and underwater acoustics. So how this works? So they use the so far um channel which i believe is called the sound i forgot but um but they, they use um they use this to basically trace the sound waves underwater so the sound velocity in the ocean normally varies with depth due to changes in density and temperature. So it can reach a local minimum near a depth of 800 to 1000 meters. So this local minimum is called the sulfur channel and that acts as a waveguide. So as the sound bends towards it, ray tracing would be used to calculate the part of that sound to the ocean up to very large distances. And this takes into account, of course, the reflections and refractions of the ocean surface and the bottom of the ocean. So yes, this is very useful for underwater acoustics you know, when you're trying to map out the underneath of the ocean and find out what is there. 
and how it works normally. So the angle of reflection is normally equal to the angle of the incidence, which is called specular reflection. So this occurs when a ray hits a reflective surface that is smooth, but in, in the water, it wouldn't be smooth. It would, hit, it would hit bumps, it would hit angles, it would hit ridges, stones, and whatnot. Um, so, so, based, so because of that, the pyramids and the, the convex curves, the sound, so due, due to that, the, um, the sound would diffuse or it would scatter. So yeah, these sound waves would just basically scatter. And that is why you would need the ray tracing to um, help find the depth and the objects. So over here, you can see they use retracing to show the um, basically waves of a tsunami. So these are tsunami waves right now, and they just they're basically tracing where it goes. <clears throat> so now we will look at the graphics aspect of retracing. So first, um, before what before what they used to use in video games was something called rasterization. So, <clears throat> so with this, um, these two dimensional shapes that you would see here, they are usually triangles. So they would make up most of the visual elements that are seen. And after that scene is drawn it would get translated or, or translated or it would get rasterized into individual pixels. And then these are not then processed by a shader. And this shader, as you can see here, it affects the colors, the textures, and the lighting effects, but this is on a per pixel basis. And it would give the fully rendered frame. So normally you would do this a certain amount of times per second, for example, 30 or 60, and it would give you the fully responsive game. However, this has limitations. It is very hard to track exactly how the light reflects and bounces off the objects. So that is why we would use ray tracing in graphics. And this ray tracing has actually been around for a very long time for graphics. You can um, show you guys what I've seen it in um, animated movies like Toy Story and Big Hero 6. But the downside to ray tracing though is the computational cost. As games, they have to be rendered at least 25 frames per second. So that is why um, with NVIDIA, they introduced consumer grade ray tracing. And this was used where basically a part is traced from a virtual camera, as you can see on your right here. And this camera represents the user's eyes through a single pixel. So this is being mapped through a single pixel to whatever the object is behind that pixel. And then it goes back to the light scene. So you can see the shadow ray and the light ray. So if whatever the ray bounces off, if it bounces off like um, a rock or a tree, a um, trunk like this, then the ray tracing, it would take the additional rays into account. So any refraction effects or shadows can be displayed accurately. So that's how they display this. And now we will look at ray tracing in game developments. So for this, I wanted to show the NVIDIA sample. So, um, so this is the game control. So if you can see 
over here is with the ray tracing off. And then over here is with the ray tracing on. So you can see if you look in the mirror over there, you can see all the reflections that the ray tracing gave. And everything, the shadows, the light, and everything is just much more realistic, even the smoke here as well, the fog. And another one is Fortnite, which it, it really, really showed the, um, obviously, and you can see the reflections there. And uh, of course, um, in Cyberpunk, if you look at the water right there, so this is retracing off and this is retracing on, you can see all the reflections. And to explain this basically, um, <clears throat> If you, it's basically, um, it's realistic mimic, mimics the properties of the light as it interacts with the objects in a 3D space. So it dynamically adjusts the way the light and effects are rendered and it just takes into account the changes of the object position and their relation to any given light source. But it is very processor intensive, so it is uh, mostly used for animation and CGI effects. Um, but NVIDIA, the NVIDIA RTX series had actually, um, you know, built it and, uh, and integrated it and made sure they were real-time retracing effects. Also, if you would like to see more of it, there's this video um, here that's really showed the reflective surfaces. It gets you reflected off there, especially. <laughs> but yeah, it just makes it very much more realistic. You can see how the light is reflecting off. <clears throat> And that is it for my presentation. So here's the credits. I just want to thank um, all these stuff for all of the information that I found. And that is it. Do you have any questions? Yeah, no, no, nice presentation, Gabby. Um, just curious, uh, are you doing something in this area right now or just out of interest? Um, no, it was just out of interest. Okay. So nothing to do with your NASA? Oh, no. Okay. Just just curious. But um, <laughs> interesting stuff. Thanks. Welcome. Gabby, great presentation. Um, my, question, my question really pertains to your comment about making what we're seeing, the visuals, more realistic. Um, mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you contrast that with um, Akil's presentation, whereby whatever's going on there in the game, it's to, mm -hmm. however the, the, I don't want to say the robots perform, it defies, you know, human failures and it's not really realistic. Um, do you think when we create bots and so on, we should, how do we make them more real? Like, based on Akil's presentation. Could you build in flaws so we know that it's not really real? If you create robots, right? That's what you said? Yeah. How do you build in Yeah, how do you make them real? Like, hmm. Realistic. Because Akil's presentation really spoke about the perfectionism. Right. But how do you, you make it more real and relatable? Yeah, I guess you would make them a bit like more human though it would be fake um you know you can mimic that effect of, of a human the emotions oh, but it okay. still would not be real in my opinion it still wouldn't be because so you can make weird. it you can make it move as humanly as possible as you want you can make the ai as advanced as you want um so it could seem, the perspective, it may seem human to you, it could. 
possibly. Okay. I could jump in for a second. Yes. Define more human like. Yeah, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> more, more you mean not like trying to like terminate oh, exactly. Yeah, like you know. So if you were being human like like for instance, we are the way we are because of what? Decades of growing up in scenarios, situations, learning and all of that. If you want an AI to be able to compete with that, you have two things. You need to have a large amount of data to train on. And then you also need the computational capability mm -hmm. or capacity. And like even if it takes like 12, 144 TPUs to train an AI to play a video game, to get an AI to recognize sarcasm or my facial reactions or uh, to make me laugh or something, that, that would take like an absurd amount. So like the human brain can't really equate to like the computational capacity we have now. So as for like getting an AI to be like Terminator right now, nah, probably not likely. To get to do some narrow task, probably. Which is like the majority of projects we have. So like recognizing sarcasm or playing a game or something like that. We could come mm -hmm. close to like human like in one task. Not a lot. Okay. All right. Thanks. And and anything that would be human like would be in the field of general AI, which of mm -hmm. course uh, is where the research is going. So like um, oh. the Android and iPhone, Cortana. And I can't remember what you're oh, like. Okay. Siri. Siri like Alexa. Oh yeah, Siri, Alexa, yeah. Oh, okay, Echo. Okay. Uh, hi, Gabby. Good evening. Good, good presentation. Um, well, I, I've always been a, a fan of Pixar, and um, I know that um, they have an entire lighting department dedicated as a final step in their animation um, pipeline, right? Um, and I guess they, they employ ray tracing to do it, as you mentioned, right? But is there any, and I, I know you said ray tracing is very computationally expensive. Um, and, and it's only mostly used for animation and CGI. But um, do, do, I don't know if you mentioned any alternatives to ray tracing that may have been used outside of the animation industry, or do they, do they employ other techniques as well? Um, do you have any examples? Because I don't really know too much about the lighting aspects that go on there, but um, I, I, I guess then there's more stuff um, besides ray tracing. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if you know any other techniques that they would have used, um, whether it be in the animation or outside of the animation industry. Yeah, there was the one I had mentioned, um, the rasterization. Rasterization, mm -hmm. okay. But that is used um, both in and out of the animation industry. I'm not sure, it's, it was used in video games. Like, yeah, I think it's also used in CGI and animation. Okay. But, but yeah, that one is, is even even more, more computationally. Yeah. Um, so is there any less computationally efficient well more computationally efficient um technique or or is it like ray tracing is like the, the best one um in terms of efficiency? I don't know if you know, um or if I have any examples. Um let's see, uh uh, I can chime in on this part. Be like, uh, so animation is almost strictly ray tracing because you don't need it to be real time. Um, mm -hmm. If you want something that's more performant, then uh, say you'd use like rasterized lighting like that. And for reflections, you'd use something called uh, screen space reflections. That's where just what is already on the screen, you would just copy that into your uh, reflection plane. But the, there's flaws with that, obviously. If you move the camera and that the object you're trying to reflect isn't on the screen anymore, then you lose that information. So there's little different little hacks that they tend to use. Mm 